Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. Welcome back to Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're going to talk about Plague Doctors, a new book by Jonathan Borkin, um, who is actually one of the Plague Doctors <laughs> as cover of the book. Uh, you can get it. It doesn't cost very much. Really worthwhile on Amazon and elsewhere. So, um, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming around. Really appreciate you uh, to flesh out what happened uh, in the plague here in Hawaii. Hawaii has had more than its fair share of plague. I mean, gee whiz, we, we lost a good solid percent of the population back in the middle of the 19th century. And you'd think that would stick with us and we would have a plan. We have a big Department of Health, though. Our Department of Health is 3,000 people plus. It's huge. Um, and one of the reasons uh, is that we lost so many people in the 19th century. <laughs> but then we are faced with the uh, first uh, SARS uh, in the early years and uh, the now more recently uh, COVID-19. And COVID-19 changed the world. And um, I guess if we thought about it at the time, we would have known it was changing the world. A million people died in this country. And government was sorely tested. And you were there. I'm so happy you were there because we needed to have your expertise, you and your colleagues. So it's wonderful that you did what you did and thought what you thought and collaborated the way you did. Um, it's also wonderful that we have you in the state to deal with this kind of thing. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. It was very humbling. And, uh, you know, a story I like to tell, I trained at University of Hawaii, at least for my medicine training. And when you walk through the ground floor uh, at Queen's Punch Bowl, you know, one of the things you see there is the portrait of Queen Emma. And, you know, she's looking down. It took me a while to research that portrait, but it, it turns out the Queen's Health Systems, you know, was built in the wake of a smallpox epidemic. So there was an attempt, a very conscious attempt uh, by the Kingdom of Hawaii uh, to produce infrastructure that would protect the Hawaiian people from pandemic disease, from epidemic and pandemic disease. And boy, when that began to sink in in March of 2020, that was a humbling moment for me. Uh, and I realized, you know, uh, we need to really step up to this moment. It's not acceptable to allow what happened in 1850 and 1860 to reoccur in 2023, not with the, the technology and the education and the resources bring there now. Um, so, so much of, of the book is a story of my attempt and the attempt of, of healthcare workers around the state of Hawaii uh, to protect the state and to prevent, you know, history from repeating itself in that way. Hmm. Well, why in the world did you go into uh, epidemiology? Uh, did you have a mentor? I mean, for example, uh, uh, Dwayne Gubler would have been a good mentor, you know? Um, did you have a mentor back when that, that directed you there? Or was this something that you could see as a phenomenon that, that will have huge effect on, on humanity going forward? I think it was it was uh, just something that drew me. You know, when I was a medical student, I liked you know doing international work. Um, so the, you know, infectious disease clinically is a, is a profession that allows you to travel quite a bit, um, and it it overlaps with epidemiology. It's not exactly epidemiology because you know we're much more just hands on with the patients, um, but there's obviously a lot of back and forth and cross fertilization between us and epidemiology. Um, in terms of mentors, absolutely. I mean, there were you know, people here in the University of Hawaii uh, uh, who mentored me, uh, people like Bruce Saul and Erlaine Bellow. Um, and then, you know, uh, an infectious disease fellowship, I had, you know, uh, uh, Opal and Flanagan, Tim Flanagan, uh, who, who was one of my mentors. So I, I've been very lucky and blessed to be around, you know, some of the most gifted and moral people uh, in the profession of medicine. And that's that's my my intellectual background. Yeah. Um, but it's dangerous, isn't it? I mean, when you when you contemplate uh, virology and epidemiology and infectious diseases, you you always think about and worry about getting it yourself, especially if you're traveling to developing countries to do research. Uh, yeah, this reminds me of uh, uh, Samuel Shem's House of God, which was a classic from residency education. He has he has these these iron laws of the House of God medicine, and I think it was the fourth law is that the patient is the one with the disease, right? So I always remind myself, it's the patient that has the disease. I don't have the disease. My job is to fight the disease. Um, and there's all kinds of tools that, that protect us as our worker. Some of those tools failed in the early phase of the pandemic, and that was genuinely scary. And, and some of those stories are in my book. 
Um, but for the most part, I've never felt unsafe at work because, you know, we have the knowledge to prevent these things from transmitting to healthcare workers. Mm. Um, uh, let me let me also straighten out one thing in my own mind is that being an epidemiologist uh, or a virologist, uh, it's really it's about vectors, it's about prevention, it's about watching a a given uh, epidemic or pandemic. Uh, um, travel from one part of the world to another. It is not necessarily about putting an oxygen mask on someone's face. Uh, it is not necessarily about uh, uh, tr trying to use um, uh, drugs that we never heard of before. Only only Donald Trump heard about them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and and trying to trying to do novel things uh, in in the hospital. It's rather about trying to find how this thing is wending its way around. Am I right? Yeah, I think, you know, virologists really focus more on the, the basic science of, of how viruses evolve, their biology, their pathogenesis. You know, epidemiology is the science of how these infections spread through human populations. And there's a fair amount of field work in epidemiology. That's a point of connection between uh, myself and DeWolf Miller. We're both very fond of that kind of thing. Um, and, and it's a, a source of friendship for us. You know, as a clinical infectious disease guy, my routine prior to the pandemic was taking care of patients with infections. And most of those infections were not occurring in, in epidemics. You know, they were occurring based on the individual risk factor of the patient. So, you know, I trained in general internal medicine, and then I learned a little bit more about how to take care of infections. Um, I never imagined that I myself would be, would be involved in, um, you know, fighting an epidemic per se. Only that if an epidemic came, I would be one of the people taking care of the patients. Um, and, and that's what ended up happening. Yeah, I like that part of your book where you, you explore the aha moment where you know everything focuses and all of a sudden you realize it's really happening. It's not a joke. And uh, I'll tell you a short story if I could. Um, you know, Think Tech uh, covers uh, tech, tech, technological conferences. And Every year, there has been a technological conference in the Hilton Hawaiian Village um, over um, um, telecommunications. It's called the Pacific Telecommunications Conference Council. And um, I have gone every year. And w one year, that is 2020, I get a letter from the president of the uh, council. And she says, uh, uh, you just want to let all you people know um, that there was a um, attendee at the conference who had who had COVID. I said, "What? What? This is January 10th, John. January 10th. That was my aha moment because I knew early there was going to be a bad time. Um, and so uh, we all had our aha moments. Some of us were very late. <laughs> Some of us never had one. <laughs> As you say, it's an intersection of so many things. Can you explore the kinds of things that, you know, that happen in the world and humanity that, that bring the virus together to make it so lethal? Yeah. I mean, emergence happens constantly. You know, uh, we, we call this emergence when we're talking about either new infections entering the human population, typically from nature or from animal reservoirs. You can use the term more broadly if there's a, an old infection that starts behaving differently. Uh, or, or fills a new niche. It's a similar idea. But, you know, what tends to happen is it's a product of, of evolution of the creature, but also human behavior and the interaction of the two. So when we have a, a booming human population and we have more and more intrusion, intrusions into nature and degradation of the natural environment, and we have more and more globalization and people moving across borders and goods moving across borders, and we have more and more medicalization, so we have more vulnerable people. You know, all of these factors can kind of come together to create emergence or reemergence of pathogens. And uh, another interesting point about that is that it appears to be happening more commonly. Um, that's a little tricky to get at because we're also a lot better at detecting it than we were maybe 100 years ago. Uh, but it does appear to be that there's an acceleration of emergence events. Um, and, and, you know, this is why infectious disease has gone from being a field that was sort of neglected and thought to be on the way out at the end of the 20th century to now one of the most important fields in medicine. Yeah. So um, I guess um, I'm interested in 
um, ex exactly um, what happened in Hawaii, and I suppose on the mainland, because uh, we weren't really prepared for the you know terrible possibilities of this virus. Um, how prepared or unprepared were we, and uh, what did we what did we see as the necessary steps, at least at at the inception? I mean, for example, uh, contact tracing. I always find interesting. That has to be you know a big study about the Hawaii response. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there was any agreement at the very beginning about how severe the threat would be or what the best countermeasures were. One thing that helped me get my head screwed on straight at the very beginning uh, was I, I played with some online epidemiology models. And one of the things that I realized when I was plugging in different assumptions, to the model um, is that, you know, these epidemics are they're mathematical phenomena. You know, they grow in time and there's something called a doubling time. So there's exponential growth of cases, right? And if you don't interrupt transmission, you have an exponential growth in cases. So, you know, you can make different assumptions about how lethal a given infection is gonna be. And if you double the lethality, then you double the number of deaths. But if you double the transmissibility, you go way more than double the number of deaths because what you've done is you've, you've fed into the monster of exponential growth that the infection has. So one, one insight I had pretty early on was that we absolutely needed to interrupt transmission, that we weren't gonna be able to survive the first punch in the first round if we didn't interrupt transmission. We knew that over time we would get better at handling the infection. So I knew that whatever the fatality rate of the infection was, it was likely to go down with time. But that if we didn't interrupt transmission at the very beginning, we were gonna get socked really hard and knocked out in the first round. And that would be the mass mortality event that we were trying to avoid. And that's kind of what we saw happening in places like Bergamo, Italy, and New York in March and April of 2020. And my work sphere at that time was that we were going to have something like that happen in Hawaii. And, you know, I'd say about 100% of the focus of my effort early was just on avoiding that. Yeah. And then can, can I throw in one factor for you to discuss? And that is the mutation, the variance. I mean, that was terrifying. You know, after you've seen it do terrible things in the space of 60, 90 days, globally spreading around the world in such a short period of time, then you find that it mutates and it mutates because there is so much spread. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, we see that with other viruses. You know, uh, those of us working in infectious disease are used to having these meetings at infection prevention and control uh, committees where we talk about which flu strains are circulating. We know flu mutates every year, um, you know, and, and we have to update flu vaccines. So I wasn't surprised to see that happening with COVID. Um, we don't really have any control over its mutation. Uh, so I, I tended to focus my own mind on things that I could control or that we could control. Um, but I wasn't surprised to see it begin to mutate. And the question with the mutation is always, okay, is this going to escape our existing countermeasures? whether they be the countermeasures that come from natural human immune responses or the, or the vaccine countermeasure or the antiviral countermeasure. So whenever I hear of a new, uh, you know, strain of COVID-19, those are the things that I'm interested in. And if there's not a, a big shift in any of those variables, then I don't worry too much about it because that's just viruses doing what viruses do. Mm. So how, how would you rate Hawaii's response. And I know it's hard to rate Hawaii's response <laughs> in, in a vacuum because it was happening globally, and especially some of the Michigas, that's a Spanish word, the Michigas uh, <laughs> on the mainland. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, if, if you could go back and look at the response we had, uh, what would you think was a good part and what was a substandard part? It's it's funny to, to be asked to grade it. I, I guess I'd give us a B plus, you know, if, if I was a if I was a, a taskmaster or, or a school teacher. You know, I think um, we avoided that first knockout fund, and that's huge. Uh, one of the things we we can try to estimate is something called the infection fatality rate, and that's if you add up all the cases and you make that the denominator over a given period of time, and then you take the deaths. That's the numerator. It's just simple division. What percentage of people? What percentage of total cases? are dying. Um, what you saw at the beginning of the pandemic 
uh, was in some places the infection fatality rate we think was was one to one and a half percent. It was as high as 1.4 percent in New York by some estimates, and, and in other places closer to one percent. And this was devastating early on. Um, right now, we think the infection fatality rate is, is likely below 0.1. So if you're going to get COVID, it's better to get COVID in year three when we have a number of countermeasures in place that can, you know, logarithmically lower your chance of dying than it was in that first few months. So to the extent that Hawaii avoided that first round knockout punch, I think we did well. And I think that is perhaps the most important single detail that people need to wrap their heads around. This was pre-vaccine, it was pre-antiviral. Uh, it was critically important that we control transmission in those early months. And enough people understood that, not everybody understood it, but enough people understood it that we were able to adopt some effective transmission control maneuvers, in particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, the 14 day entry quarantine, uh, the, the very first lockdown, and then eventually the tier system that came into place in Honolulu. All of those things were pre-vaccine. Um, the reason why it wouldn't give us an A is because we didn't really develop the kind of public health infrastructure that I would have really liked us to do, or we did, but it took a while. And, and that's the, the kind of Singapore style, Korea style uh, public health interventions that they started rolling out at the very beginning. So if you look, for example, at the Korean public health response, from the very beginning, they had testing. From the very beginning, they had contact tracing. They had centralized quarantine or centralized quarantine. They had wraparound support services. All of those things were integrated. And it took us about, oh, eight or nine months to stand that up in Hawaii which was too long. And then we dismantled most of it as soon as we had a vaccine available. I would like us to have that as kind of muscle memory that we can you know, immediately implement the next time there's a, a major pandemic. Um, so I think that would be the difference between a B and an A. Okay, well, thank you for that. What would you give Singapore? You know, uh, uh, taking a look at the behind, <laughs> behind the mask, which uh, see, they seem to be able to get their hands on it in six months. Yeah, I, this is fine. The great different uh, uh, responses. I, you know, I would give Singapore an A minus, uh, and and, and the, <laughs> I'm I'm being ridiculous, of course. But I think what Singapore did very well was they had a kind of integrated response from the very beginning. We, we you know, we the, the, along the lines that we were just discussing. Um, one one area where Singapore struggled was they had a very large population of migrant workers uh, in 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 housing, and you know they. They did take care of those workers when they got infected, but the, the, the illness absolutely ripped through uh, the migrant worker housing. And it's sort of the, the economic underbelly of mm -hmm. Singapore. It's this large population, densely crowded population of migrant workers. Uh, I'm not sure what their, what their wage situation is. Um, but, you know, that ended up sort of being their Achilles heel. And, and it also ended up being the Achilles heel for a lot of other jurisdictions on the mainland United States. It tended to be other crowded into our places, public housing, prisons, places like that. Here in Hawaii, we had a big outbreak in public housing. Um, so what happened was the virus just took advantage of whatever gaps there were uh, in our social fabric. And, and that's where it inserted itself. Well, New Zealand and Australia, you cover this in the book, um, did better because they came down hard right away and shut out any visitors. Unfortunately, Hawaii's economy is connected with visitors, and we didn't see it the same way. Had we shut things down the way Australia and New Zealand did, uh, we would have done better, clearly, but how much better? Yeah, I mean, if you look at our mortality compared to the American mainland, we had the lowest mortality rate in the country. Um, so if you compare us to Florida, for example, I, I like to bring up Florida because uh, their governor seems so proud of his COVID response. But if you look at our fatality rate compared to Florida's fatality rate, we're about a third of where Florida is. Um, but if you compare us to places like New Zealand, uh, we're considerably higher. Um, so I think we could have had a lower mortality had we controlled transmission even more aggressively early on. But as you point out, we're more dependent than New Zealanders on tourism. Um, and this gets at some of that infrastructure that I'm talking about. Had some of that infrastructure been stronger at the very beginning, we may have been able to maintain more international travel. Um, for example, if we had the ability to produce a, a locally produced uh, test and we could have tested people upon arrival, we might not have needed to shut down the airline for 10 months like we did. Um, so, you know, in the future, 
uh, and this is this is my hope for Hawaii is that we develop some of this you know nascent biotech um, that we can accomplish much of what we accomplished in 2020, but with less disruption, with less disruption in particular to public schools, and possibly with less disruption in travel. Yeah. Well, yeah, I do want to reserve some time with us today to talk about the takeaway lessons. But, but first, I, I just want to uh, suggest that Hawaii does have a special social, special sauce. Um, and as you write the book, you talk about other uh, virologists, other epidemiologists that are uh, at Jabsom and elsewhere in the state uh, who made significant contribution. And you guys collaborated um, and you worked out, you know, collaborative solutions, decisions, uh, protocols that actually had a pretty good effect. And I'm thinking of Elaine Bellow, for example. I'm thinking of uh, Scott, I can't remember his last name, in Queen's Mr. Hospital. Mitch. Uh, oh, Ms. Yeah, Gallagher, Miskovic, Scott or, Gallagher, Chief Scott Gallagher, yeah. Miskovich. I mean, there were some real heroes in the story in Hawaii, and that, that's partly because you guys talk to each other, and um, you know, it's a professional thing. But it, it's more than that. It's a, it's a, it's a network of expertise. Thank God we have that. Uh, can you talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I and that would be a good time for me to point out that I'm not a representative for Queens, and I don't speak for them in any official way. But my career has been wrapped up with Queens Hospital since I was a resident, um, because that's the place that I've worked. And uh, I feel really lucky by the colleagues that I've had there. So, you know, like any other group of people at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we came to the realization that we were dealing with this problem at different speeds. We did not completely agree with each other at the very beginning. Um, but one thing that's really lovely about Hawaii is that we were able to have those discussions in a way that was constructive. And that allowed us to come together and that allowed us to, to form a, a closer approximation to the truth relatively quickly and to do what we needed to do to protect patients. So, you know, my collaborations really began within the hospital. And then it became clear as I was, you know, messing around with these epidemiologic models online that we could do everything right in the hospital. But if we didn't control transmission outside the hospital, the hospital was going to get crushed. It was going to get overwhelmed, no matter how well we did internally. And that's when I began speaking with a, a wider group of people, uh, including people like the Wolf Miller, you know, Kim Brown, Sumner and Pra, uh, people at the University of Hawaii and New Harrow, and then eventually uh, people within, you know, Kirk Caldwell's orbit, uh, who were uh, involved in the county response. So we ended up having a two-tier strategy, and, and the book very much reflects this. There were the things that were happening in the hospital. And those were the daily stories of doctors fighting the disease up close and personal. And I think that's what most readers tend to connect with in my book. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a parallel story unfolding, which was how can we stand up public health infrastructure that allows us to knock down transmission prior to widespread vaccination? And, and that gets at the policy level and the public health level. And those were a different set of collaborations for me. Yeah, the public health level was criticized. Uh, the public health, uh, you know, level way into the pandemic, uh, months and months, uh, it became clear in the press that uh, there was very little effective contact uh, tracing, um, and which is kind of remarkable because it, uh, at the time, as I remember, there were various software packages that would geographically connect uh, uh, patients. So all you had to do was get the data, and you would you could draw a map of where it was and where it came from and so forth. But we didn't do that. Uh, am I right? Can you can you help me with that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think you know um, the the public health infrastructure in Hawaii that existed pre pandemic uh, was focused a lot on managing known diseases. So you know, I interact on a regular basis with the tuberculosis control branch at the Department of Health in order to take care of my patients. Uh, sometimes the leprosy branch, sometimes venereal diseases, other infections. They're very good at that. They're very good at their jobs. Um, what I think we were less well prepared for was an emergency response. An emergency response is a completely different sense. And what it, what it requires you to do is make a quick read on the, on the situation, try to identify what are the crucial variables. You know, and in this case, transmission was probably the crucial variable early on. And then stand up infrastructure quickly, tackle that. And I think you know, we were just too slow as a state in that area. Later on, when, when Libby Char uh, was running the Department of Health, Libby has a, a, an emergency medicine background. 
And I think that's kind of the right mindset for a pandemic. Um, so that's that's one possible lesson from all of this. Um, but yeah, no, I think uh, uh, there were opportunities. You know, one of the early opportunities was, was to get testing done quickly. That wasn't purely a local problem. That was a national problem. As you probably recall, you know, the CDC had problems with their initial test kits. And the FDA was holding everybody up on lab-developed kits. So, you know, the Koreans were rolling out mass testing, and we were waiting for permission from the FDA to, to get private labs to offer testing. Um, as far as I know, that still hasn't been fixed. If there's a pandemic tomorrow, we're going to be sitting on our hands waiting for permission from the FDA to test people. Mm. Um, so so that, that whole playbook needs to be reconsidered. And it's, it's a federal issue. It's a state issue. Um, you know, and, and then obviously it impacts medicine for individual people. Well, how do you, how do you think the federal government, um, how would you rate the, <laughs> how would you rate the federal government? There's just so many hiccups. I mean, we should have cleaning fluid. We should have all these drugs we never heard of, horse drugs and all this. Um, and then, you know, this very strange mixed message about taking vaccines or not taking vaccines, wearing masks or not wearing masks. Um, so I really, there's a two-part question. Was how do you rate them in terms of dealing with the national, international issue? And the other thing is, did their, I, I hesitate, but I'm going to use the word again. Did their Michigas have have any effect on Hawaii? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, just to take that last part, you look at the, the testing fiasco. You know, a lot of the, the tensest moments for me in the early part of the pandemic. Uh, we're, we're trying to stand up testing, you know, not being able to test. It's like you're going into a boxing match with a blindfold on, on your face. You don't even know where it is. You, know, you don't know how many cases you have in the community because you're not testing anyone. And then you're reassuring everyone that the risk, risk is low because you're not seeing cases. And that's circular logic, right? So to reassure everyone at the beginning of the pandemic, you do a lot of tests and see them coming back negative. And then you can say, okay, with confidence, we're pretty sure it's not here yet. We had no ability to do that for so that absolutely impacted us. And it's one of the reasons why in my, in my book and, and in every, every time I've had the chance to talk about it since, I've advocated for us to develop uh, biotech infrastructure locally that allows us to develop our own tests. And obviously, we need some regulatory reform around that, too, so that we're allowed to use it. Um, you know, the Koreans did not have that problem. They had multiple local labs. They had entrepreneurs partnering with their government that gave them situational awareness right from the very beginning. That's the gold standard. That's what we should be trying to do. Um, there were other issues, you know, with the CDC response early on. Uh, repatriation of people on cruise ships where cases mm. were was a major issue. Um, mixed messaging around masks was a major issue. I, I think, to be fair, the problem is not that they sometimes change their advice. The problem is that they were not very transparent about why they were changing their advice. So it's okay to say, we don't know we think this is the right thing to do. Here's the information that we're trying to obtain. And when we know more, this recommendation might change. But when you kind of change the recommendation without acknowledging that you got it wrong or why you got it wrong or what your reasoning is, that's what creates distrust. So um, I don't think it's a it, the consistency of the messaging is not the issue so much. It's the lack of transparency. Well, you know, your book is really a great contribution, not only to the medical field, because I think it's, uh, it's, it's a book that every doctor ought to read, honestly, um, but, but to the public in general, because this affects us all and it will happen again, and maybe worse as you know, these various factors you describe uh, you know, are uh, escalated. So <clears throat> my question is, what, what are the takeaways that we should focus on? I mean, Yes, we should uh, maybe correct their, our regulatory environment. Uh, we, should, we should learn. A million people died. We owe it to them to learn. And that's what your book is about. It's about learning how to deal with it the next time. But what are the big takeaway points, John? Yeah, I mean, well, on the positive side, I think we have a culture here that is collaborative and that's cooperative um, in which, you know, there's this notion that we should protect vulnerable members of our community, um, that we should not be selfish in situations in which there's public crisis. Um, this gets back to the host culture, to the Hawaiian culture, to the notions of aloha. We absolutely should lean into that. And uh, to me, one of the important takeaways from the book is that, you know, one of the reasons we did well relative to many other parts of the country is because we have this 
unique local culture of cooperation. I, I, wanna, I want us to celebrate that. Um, you know, we also leaned into our geography. You know, we essentially used the Pacific Ocean as a giant moat. And I think that at least in the early months of the pandemic, that was clearly the right call. It was a controversial call. Not everybody liked it. It definitely did some economic damage. And there's no doubt in my mind that it saved hundreds, if not thousands of lives. So, uh, you know, we're, we're almost certainly going to have to do that in the future if we want to have a successful response. Um, in terms of areas of improvement, it, it's the stuff we were just talking about. Can we get testing out quicker? Can we have an aggressive emergency response that does things like contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine? Can we take advantage of hotel rooms that aren't being occupied right from the get-go and use them as quarantine facilities? I mean, these are what the, the places that did the best in the world did. And then by using those advantages, can we have less disruption to the core parts of our economy that matter most to us and to the core parts of the culture that matter most to us? And what I'm particularly thinking about is public education. Uh, because, you know, the school shutdown was entirely too long, in my opinion, and unnecessary. So, you know, if we could, if we could, you know, uh, learn some of these lessons and, and apply them in the future, I think we could have less disruption to education and other areas. Now, well, that takes me to the question of the vaccines. Uh, and I was astounded that there were such large numbers of people who were politicized, uh, who, who hung on some sort of religious notion and refused to wear vaccine to uh, take vaccines, um, and 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 argued with those who wanted to take vaccines. I mean, it, it became a ridiculous debate. Ridiculous. Your thoughts? Well, for me, this was settled during the Delta wave because, as you'll recall, the Delta wave hit in the middle of 2021. Most of the population of the island had already been vaccinated. I think our vaccine rate here on the Big Island was about 60%. So that meant about 40% of my island here was not vaccinated. And I got to see up close and personal uh, an unethical science experiment play out where, where half the island had been vaccinated and half had it, right as a, a highly transmissible variant rolled through. And the result was a uh, disaster. You know, uh, our, our, our hospital filled up with uh, unvaccinated patients who had bilateral pneumonia. Uh, at the peak of the Delta wave, 50% of our beds were occupied uh, by COVID patients, uh, almost all of whom had pneumonia and almost all of whom were unvaccinated. Uh, so it was uh, a tragedy. And, you know, I, I don't know what to say. You know, snake oil is as old as America. You know, you can find it in Mark Twain. There's always going to be people pushing snake oil. Um, and, and uh, you know, shame on you if you fall for it. Um, I think, I think uh, that's clearly a major problem going forward is this misinformation. What do we do about it? Yeah, I totally agree. It's like uh, when you have a really bad experience, like catastrophe, a global catastrophe like this, you want to learn from it. And you want to say never again. Those lessons are serious lessons and they affect millions of lives. So let's not allow people to die when we can save them. Gee whiz. Um, but, you know, the, the state of humanity is to forget. When we say never again, we're saying never for a little while. <laughs> and then we forget. So mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you, you know, it, it seems clear to me that we live in a, in a, in a soup of uh, a virus that's it's part of our planet, part of our Earth, um, and it bites humanity once in a while, starting a long time ago. And, yeah. um, and it will continue to do that. But the factors that, uh, that make it more dangerous uh, are increasing and will continue to increase. There's a relationship, of course, between climate change and COVID. Think Tech made a movie about that, uh, actually, um, and looking into exactly what the origin might have been in, in China or elsewhere. And um, I guess I guess what I'm asking is um, um, this is going to happen again. I think we can agree on that. Are we going to be better prepared? And uh, is your is your book a roadmap on how to be better prepared? But is it also a roadmap on how an autocrat, a an evil person, uh, could could use um, uh, virus technology? Um, for really bad purposes, too. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of my book is focused on 
our communication and, and the way we relate to each other and, and the gaps that that created that allowed the virus to exploit our vulnerabilities. You know, part of my book is kind of bedtime story for, for residents of Hawaii about, you, you know, how do we fight this off? And um, I think there's a fundamentally optimistic message in the book, actually. Um, but there's also a, a frank discussion. I couldn't resist it. I'm, I'm, you know, originally a Northeast guy. I'm pretty blunt. There's a frank discussion in there about things that I think we could have done better um, and where I think our, our social vulnerabilities lie. It's not inevitable that we're going to do better next time. Uh, a different set of personalities, a different leader, a more cynical person in a powerful position, do a tremendous amount of damage. And that's why it's important that I think we have these conversations and that, you know, uh, people understand that they have a role to play in making sure that the outcome is a happy one. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I can get your book on Amazon. I did. Um, and I suppose uh, Kirk Caldwell wrote a book similar. How would you compare the two? Stylistically, they're quite different. You know, uh, Kirk, Kirk had, you know, had a, a, obviously a very different view. You know, I'm, 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 I'm taking a ground level view as a doctor. And then there are parts of the book where I intersect and overlap with, uh, with Mayor Caldwell that are, that are interesting. But you know, he had access to all the most powerful people in the state and uh, interviewed many of them. And his book is a series of conversations and it's as such a really excellent addition to this conversation. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to find that uh, the basic underlying themes and the message of the two books I think are complementary. I think uh, we see things very similarly actually. So we should buy yours first and his second, right? That's right. <laughs> you know, I don't say this to everybody, Jonathan, but I, I do say it to you. Um, I don't. I know you didn't make a million billion uh, in in the course of the uh, COVID <laughs> experience. Uh, we learned a lot, and maybe there's a great value in terms of being on the on the earth and learning a lot, and and, and having a a life with some depth and value to learn a lot. Um, but the other thing is that you have you have provided Hawaii, you have um, contributed to Hawaii and its uh, success and to the extent it was successful. Uh, and to its future success. So I want to I want to say one thing. Thank you for your service, Jonathan. Uh, we appreciate all that you've done, and we appreciate your uh, contribution to the to our quality of life. It was my pleasure to help, and I appreciate the time on your show. Thanks, Jeff. Jonathan Dworkin, Doctor Jonathan Dworkin, uh, talking about uh, his new book. Uh, and it's about uh, COVID. It's about COVID in Hawaii. So take a look at it. Thank you, Jonathan. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.